All right, so I'm Saul Griffith. Uh, I work at a little lab called Other Lab. Uh, we have too much fun, as you'll find out shortly. Um, I'm actually going to talk today about going soft, um, which is going to be an elaborate discussion of why this is the past of engineering. So this is a rigid, many pieces of, you know, many mechanisms to try and do that. And the future of engineering is actually this amazing device, which was the only example of soft engineering that I have yet found, which is a sing instead of lots of complexity and lots of parts, it's one part, shoots further. <laughs> I'll hand these around. <laughs> And, and uh, the rest of the talk is just to justify bringing those two guns to the table. So how did this, my interest in engineering soft has been long standing. Um, for no particular reason, I've had a fascination with building inflatable objects, including things like inflatable dinosaurs and elephants. Uh, and I gave that elephant that you just saw to this young lady, and this is in fact the X that I am solving for because I gave her this sort of rigid inflatable elephant and she said, that's great Uncle Saul. Uh, this young lady's name is Emily. she's my niece. And she said, yes, Uncle Saul, that's great, but I, I would like to ride my elephant to school. Can you make it walk? And I'd never really thought about it. Um, so we built this. Well, I actually had my sister send back the elephant. We simulated whether it was possible and doing and making some new types of fluidic muscles. Could we make this thing walk? Uh, and sure enough, here is Stumpy um, taking its first steps. It can move at the astonishing speed of one mile every eight days. Um, which, <laughs> incidentally, Emily thinks is perfect for riding to school. Um, so that's really how it all began. Um, this was the, the next robot we built, because indeed, you have to pr you know, test these things on your children. So this is my son, Huxley. Um, the helmet is really just because I knew his grandmothers were going to watch the video. Uh, and he's riding the actual first rideable walking robot. So what's, what's amazing about this is the, you know, the history of mechanical engineering and design. And in fact, every artifact around us is we pretty much only make stiff, rigid, hard things. With, you know, and to give movement, we have bearings and all that. This is just sewn. There is no hinges. There's no bearings. There's, there's really no mechanism. If you deflate it, it's a pile of fabric. Um, so I guess what I'm, this is sort of the, I'm only going to show one equation because you lose at least half the audience each time you do. Uh, engineer, I'm going to make the argument, engineering has been prisoner to this. This is Hooke's law, which states, you know, it's, this is basically the stress-strain relationship that we, we want to be linear. And so we've been prisoners since then. These curves, you know, so we can plot these curves for all manner of materials and, and to a certain extent mechanisms. And all engineering throughout all of history is pretty much being constrained to using this nice linear approximation where we can understand materials as, as, soft, uh, as rigid and linear and mechanisms. And I guess I'm fascinated with the enormous green fields of what we can do and what we can build uh, if we engineer with things outside that, that linear constraint and, and we sort of learn how to engineer soft. This is a fabulous example of, from biology. All the soft things are from biology. So this is a puffer fish, and in fact, it redefines stress-strain curves completely. If you look, <laughs> this is a stress-strain curve for a puffer fish way out there on the right. This is highly nonlinear and very different to any other material, um, and it gives these fish the amazing capacity to change shape so extraordinarily. So um, to try and tie this to moonshots, you know, I think I like to think of the artifacts of a moonshot. You know, if you if you're sufficiently ambitious, you have to develop new materials, new mechanisms new design tools, new control systems, and even new destinations. And they are sort of the artifacts of a moonshot. And I think the reason I'm fascinated with this going after soft engineering is we're going to have all of these artifacts of that moonshot, and they're going to change our lives in all sorts of fabulous ways. So this is a little video from the Whitesides group at Harvard. Um, this is just to show that I'm not the only fruit loop in the world thinking about this stuff. Um, this is a fabulous, much smaller scale and, and you know, subtly different mechanisms, extremely elastic grippers. This is picking up a, um, uh, an uncooked egg, which is a traditionally very difficult thing for a robot to do. And this is a beautiful uh, demonstration of some of the unique capacities 
uh, that we can do if we start to engineer soft. So here's a walking gait of a little rubber um, robot, I guess. Comes up against a, a glass ceiling uh, and now can you know, completely change gates and go under it. So these mechanisms are great at the smaller scale than the sort of the inflatable things that we're doing good at big scales. You know, all of these things, uh, you know, we need to, we're still at the, so early in this engineering of soft things that we're just sort of establishing what is possible at the moment and what the new design memes are. So one insight is soft things that I want everyone to understand is soft things can do unique things and they can do things just as well or even better as hard things. So this is a bluefin tuna one of the most astounding and fast swimming of all the fish. It achieves that speed by having a very long tail um, and then a very tall tail, which is actually a wing. It's a very high aspect ratio, very efficient wing that it can beat um, with all the muscles down the back to propel itself very quickly. The forces on that wing at the, the rear are extreme. So it has, in fact, a very bony tail wing and that, uh, that stiffness and rigidity of, of that enables it to, the, that tail to not buckle at high speed. This is the shark that you know, evolutionarily diverged from the tuna you know, 400 million years ago. It is made of cartilage, and we never really understood how could the shark swim, in fact, faster than the tuna, as it does, when it has no rigid elements in the tail. So the, the body, and particularly the tail, that wing surface, should buckle under all the incredible loads. It turns out what the shark does is it has a whole lot of advanced, you know, it's an, it's an extremely advanced fiber composite, so it has all of these uh, fibers in the, in the in actually all over its body, particularly in the tail, and then it pressurizes the various uh, aspects of it, so it inflates itself, puts these things under tension, and in fact makes a structure that is lighter per weight and stiffer than the bony structure of the tuna. What's incredible is, and another feature of soft things if we learn to engineer them, the shark actually has a very large dynamic range because it changes the pressure of the, its stiffness. So at high speeds, it's, it's high, highly pressurized to go super fast. At low speeds, it depressurizes, so it's extremely maneuverable. Um, just because I promised to, uh, this is an armadillo penis, um, which for some reason is how we're trying to learn to understand these things. We're just, you know, some scientists are, are trying to figure out how, how these things work. So there was an, uh, the problem of the penis or the mystery was it should buckle under the loads uh, that it is exerted to. How does it survive it? And you can actually see in cross section, we're starting to understand again by pressurizing fibers that are oriented, uh, in this case collagen fibers that are oriented in the correct fashion, we can, ex uh, we can get extreme stiffness and prevent buckling and other loads and have, again, uh, machines that have a sort of large dynamic range of capacities. So why is now the right time to do soft engineering where it wasn't previously? I think we finally have enough compute to simulate and design and control these things. We're starting to get the sensors that enable us to control these things. Um, there are new materials, new textile technologies, and new elastomers. So I think we are now ready to go. Um, these things can do, uh, here's, here's the ant roach as we call it, uh, half, half cockroach, half anteater. We're doing proportional control so we can actually do quite high precision um, with the, the nose there. And then here it is doing a walking gait. This guy can now walk at uh, one or two miles an hour. And then we're building a platform this year that'll hopefully do 10 or 20 miles an hour. The amazing thing about this robot that you're seeing is it weighs about 50 pounds and can in fact support uh, a very large load. Uh, so there's two, two adults and two children riding that thing. So in terms of strength to weight ratio with these types of machines, we can expect as much as 10 or 1,000 times um, uh, traditional machines. Soft will mean lighter weight, which can mean lower costs. They can, these mechanisms can be more efficient. They can be more resilient to damage, high dynamic range. They can be tunable. And they're going to enable entirely new applications. I'm fascinated with doing this, so not just fill them with air for terrestrial applications, but this would be a tremendous way to do deep sea exploration. We can, you know, if it's filled with water, it can be at the same pressure as the, the sea below it, so it won't suffer a lot of the problems of traditional submarines 
And then because of the elasticity and the design of the mechanisms, we can actually do much better. This graph really sort of shows you that you can expect if you can operate these elastic machines uh, at resonant frequencies, much higher um, mechanical efficiency. So go longer while we're down there. Um, there's another insight here. This compliance can be substituted for mass. And human engineers, we solve all problems by adding more steel, more concrete, more plastic, and, uh, and make things more rigid to prevent damage. Biology has, does, solves these problems with compliance. So trees survive storms better than telegraph poles because the trees can change shape, they can shed the wind loads. So you know, I think we need to start applying those types of insights to how we engineer things. Here is a comical example of that. Um, this is actually an inflatable car that we built, um, really just because you can. Um, and then it's like, you know, it's a, basically it's an electrified wearable airbag. Uh, you can actually roll this thing and, and land sunny side up and keep going. But then one of the features of these things is you can crash this all day. <laughs> And, and you do. It's actually the most fun thing to do with that uh, inflatable car. So just to dream about the application space, um, I'm really interested in prosthetics. This is not a prosthetic. Well, it, it sort of is a prosthetic, but it's just a, a brace. But um, we are now actually have sort of very crude prototypes of making soft exoskeletons. You might call them exodermises that you can actuate. And we could, we could use these for you know, doing fabulous things like giving, giving able-bodied people superhuman strength, or for um, uh, we're looking at uh, helping uh, stroke victims and spinal cord injuries uh, to, to remediate. So I'm fascinated with those applications. I think in an aging population, uh, actually wearable soft uh, external muscles so that seven-year-olds can play tennis like they were still 20 would be a fabulous application. Um, to just quickly go to another fabulous soft machine, this is the heart. Um, we've just recently learned that the heart is in fact a linear thing tied in a knot. And here is an example of a soft machine that's fabulous. It's a pump with huge dynamic range. And just by sort of twisting backwards and forwards, sending a, a wave down that string that is tied into a knot, we get our pumping. We're now starting to experiment. So this is a, a, a soft pump that we're using to hydraulically drive one of our um, prosthetics, and this is going to give us a thousand-fold increase in strength uh, or in power, again, to go to hydraulic pneumatics, and I think it's going to be a fabulous way to add strength to these machines. Uh, I, am, I, I think, you know, Rodney Brooks said it yesterday fabulously, we are, we have to expect to have more robots sharing our environment with us, so they need to be human safe, and there's some beautiful natural compliance and human safety about these robots. Fascinated with that. And then just maybe one of the other, this is another type that we've been experimenting with. And one of the fabulous things about the strength to weight ratio, these robots can be extremely light and then consequently can be incredibly fast because they have very little inertia. So also intrigued with applications where that type of speed is interesting. Obviously super hard, we have to bring them under control. <laughs> and you probably guessed we haven't done a great job of that yet. Although, as we were talking about smiley faces yesterday, we can, in fact, draw smiley faces with this thing now. <laughs> so slowly getting it under control. So I think uh, the soft, soft engineering can and will uh, revolutionize prosthetics, robotics, our human-machine interactions, just mechanical design across the board. Uh, I think what it enables an exploration of space and undersea in, in and of itself justifies doing this uh, for medical devices and just for toys and because you can and for delighting six-year-old nieces. We should do this. Um, and then, you know, I think this is, this is the really, I, I actually bought this robot here, I hope you all come and shake its hand. I think the really compelling moment of these machines is when you actually shake its hand and you, you sort of, it feels much more human than any other machine you've ever touched. So I think this moment is the aha moment. Just quickly in wrapping up, what's next is, is bringing these things under control, finding fabrication techniques to make them simulation in the loop so that we can design these things. There is no CAD tool called Softworks. We have everything SolidWorks and you know, rigid, so we need new design tools. And then super exciting to me is, uh, this is Manu Prakash's work at Stanford. He's uh, reinvigorating the, the field of uh, fluidic comp computation. 
So while we have these fluidics on these things, we can do integrated computation, integrated actuation, integrated control, uh, which will be fabulous. This is actually uh, fluidic logic from the 70s. Uh, you can even do combustion inside these chambers, so we could further increase uh, the capacity of these things by actuating them in their skins. And then this is wonderful work by Rebecca Kramer, who was out of the white size group, uh, doing soft sensors. And so now we'll, we'll actually be able to do you know, fabulous proprioception with entire skin sensors uh, coupled to these robots. So by moonshot standards, you know, this is going to be cheap. It just really, what's hard here is changing the way we think about designing machines and raising a generation to consider soft as well as hard. Soft is cuddly. Soft is good. Thanks very much. Thank you.